So I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. David Punkus and Joanna Roman to the Performance Psychology Podcast. So welcome to you both. I'm very excited to have you on this episode. And more specifically today, we're going to talk about acceptance and commitment training or acceptance and commitment therapy and how it applies to more specifically performance anxiety uh, within the musical uh, arrangement. So uh, welcome to you both. And yeah, nice to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having us here. Thank you. I'm so excited. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure we'll have a great episode. Uh, lots to discuss and lots to get through. So uh, would you mind just giving me a little bit about your background and, and how you've uh, come into acceptance or act acceptance commitment training? Joanna, you want to go first? All right. Um, so I discovered ACT when I was a psychology student. It was about my second year of university. Then I joined uh, ACBS and I met amazing people in Poland because I'm Polish. So they introduced me to the whole idea. I could participate in conferences, organizing workshops. So after finishing university, I go directly to, I went directly to the psychotherapy office. I could be a assistant and do my own kind of um, workshops for musicians to, to help them with their music anxiety. And then I moved to London and I found my um, clients that I'm helping at the moment. Um, and I'm a member of um, British um, Psychology Society and HCPC. So yeah, this is my background. I, I also finished music conservatory for opera performance. And in my free time, I teach piano and music and I work with um, different people from children to adults to help them develop their abilities Fantastic. and goals. <laughs> Thanks, Joanna. She also runs a Facebook page too. I think you forgot. Oh, about, yeah. Thank you, you for, act, for that. Is it yes. Act For? And it's not Act For Music because that's the one that Deborah Harden Australia runs. Yeah. Act With uh, Music, I think. Yes. Actually, I didn't know about, about her when I was developing this idea. So it's Act With Music. Act with um, music. I'm in the process of creating a, like my own website. And as well, I have this uh, Instagram page as well. So <laughs> a lot of social media stuff. Fantastic. I'll definitely put some links into the, uh, the video bio. Uh, David, would you like to give us a little bit of your background? Sure, sure. So I'm Dr. Dave Hunkos. I'm a clinical psychologist in group private practice in Philadelphia in the United States. Um, been working in the mental health field for nearly 20 years now, I think. Um, working as a therapist for about 15 of those 20 years. Uh, as a psychologist, I see a variety of patients, uh, primarily adults and teens. Um, treating mood, anxiety, substance abuse, ADHD, personality disorder clients as well. Um, so that's kind of my, my full-time gig there. Uh, in the last maybe 10 years or so, I've definitely taken a strong interest in working with musicians who have performance anxiety. I uh, wrote my dissertation on that topic. So I guess that's uh, an answer to your question, how I got into ACT. Um, treated a professional rock drummer and jazz drummer uh, who had performance anxiety, or we, we call MPA music performance anxiety their uh, synonymous with you're going to hear me say MPA all the time today. Yeah. Um, he uh, was an interesting case. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get to publish that. I applied to publish for that in the Journal of Contextual Behavioral Science. I wasn't accepted, but he got better after 12 ACT sessions for his MPA. So that was really cool. And that's kind of what led me into this direction here. Um, although I am a musician, I should probably add to that too. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I've always kind of, you know, enjoyed working with musicians and creative clients in my clinical work. So treating musicians with performance anxiety is kind of my way of keeping one foot in that world since I don't really perform as much as I used to. So um, after doing that dissertation project, uh, since it went well, I replicated that with a student violinist, uh, undergraduate student violinist. She got 10 sessions of ACT for MPA, she got better. So that was inspiring. I took on a, a larger role. I, I did a pilot study with seven vocal students uh, all receiving 12 individual sessions of ACT, as well as the second half of the therapy was group performances in front of each other. Uh, that went well too. So the research is kind of taking off. 
and I'm happy to talk about future directions where it's been going, but uh, over the last 10 years, I've really developed that specialty in using ACT to treat MPA, so. And, and what is it uh, for you both? What is it about performance anxiety specifically that's, that's kind of got you so interested in, in helping others with, with this mode of, of therapy? I, I can answer as a clinician, and I'm sure Joanna can answer uh, as a performer, but as a clinician slash researcher, uh, it's certainly a highly prevalent problem. And, you know, the best estimates are putting the prevalence somewhere for professionals around like a third to maybe even as, as high as a half of professional musicians suffer with it. And there's discrepancy in the, in the prevalence because it's not often defined in the same way across studies. So some researchers call it stage fright, some call it, you know, uh, social anxiety disorder, kind of performance only subtype. Um, others call it by, by other names. So it's difficult to know exactly what we're measuring. So that's why you see that kind of broad discrepancy in the prevalence data there. But uh, so a lot of people struggle basically. So that's what motivates me to want to help them. How about you, so, Joanna? From my perspective, I can say um, I was struggling with performance anxiety myself. And I was observing my colleagues from the music conservatory struggling with this as well. So I was doing two courses at the same time. Um, it was a opera course and psychology. And I was asking myself a lot of questions. Um, how can we treat it? What can we do? And I received a lot of funny feedback from my teachers like, you are a psychologist, help yourself, manage your stress. <laughs> So yeah, and then I decided, okay, maybe, maybe I should, you know, <laughs> and I was digging in, finding solutions. What can I do? And how can I help future generations of students to have a better experience than I did? I mean, I, so I come from the, uh, from a golf world and I've, I've played golf at a, at a pretty high level, um, winning a national championship and so on. Uh, so very used to performing in front of lots of people and again that performance anxiety uh, I think kind of more traditional methods within sport have been uh, lots of positive thinking lots of self-talk um, my experience really led to a lot of mental exhaustion with those techniques so uh, when I came across ACT it was uh, it was quite liberating to, to realize that I maybe didn't have to battle and wrestle with uh, with negative thoughts and feelings and and being anxious and nervous as much as I did um, what if what have you guys found in terms of uh, the, the more mindfulness based approaches compared to traditional approaches with performance anxiety uh, if I can jump in I to, to connect this to the background um, at my doctoral program, the former director was Frank Gardner, the, the creator of the Mindfulness Acceptance Commitment, the MAC approach for performance enhancement. I didn't actually get the chance to work with him directly, uh, but perhaps, you know, just being around him kind of planted the seeds for me to take that kind of approach and work with musicians. Um, but yeah, certainly within his studies and, and his colleagues' studies, you know, they compare MAC to like psychological skills training with, you know, visualization, goal setting, arousal control, uh, positive, you know, self-talk, et cetera. And uh, yeah, the, the jury's kind of still out on whether or not those strategies actually lead to enhanced performance. So um, in fact, I think it was uh, Frank's wife, Zella Moore, who did her dissertation kind of dismantling all of the psychological skills training components to see, you know, do each one of these kind of lead to enhanced performance? And the answer sadly was no. Um, rather, it was the combination of several uh, psychological skills like uh, used at once that kind of led to an enhanced performance. So I, I think there's, you know, I, I don't know enough about the sports psych literature, perhaps, you know, more than I do, but um, I think the time was right, you know, like in the last like 20 years with, with the third wave of behavioral, you know, uh, mindfulness-based therapies kind of coming into existence and, you know, perhaps the frustration that athletes were feeling and the complete lack of knowledge that musicians have had along the entire way, you know, musicians are like kind of behind the, the, the curve, unfortunately, with the treatments that they get. Uh, you know, it just seems like the time was right for a change in, in how we approach treating performance anxiety and how we enhance performance. So, um, yeah, it, it just seemed like everything was converging together, I think. Mm. Yeah. I've had a, a really interestingly when, when we kind of started uh, communicating and um, 
I bumped into, so that was a, a few weeks ago, and I bumped into a, a, a relative of mine that I hadn't seen for a, for a long time. And uh, I mentioned about the podcast and, and starting that. And uh, she'd been a fantastic, and she still is a fantastic pianist. And uh, she told me a wonderful story about, you know, in her youth, she used to play in front of hundreds of people. And she revealed to me that, you know, she hadn't played in front of anyone for, you know, outside of family members for about 30 years, where yeah. she'd had an experience on stage with someone obviously turning the pages for her of the music. And then they'd, uh, you know, lost concentration, not turn the page at the right time. She completely lost her, her flow. Um, and that, that single moment, you know, created such anxiousness and, and dread and fear in her because it really ruined the performance um, that she never played again, um, which was then funny because I mentioned I was going to be speaking to both of you, but I imagine that's a pretty common, pretty common experience for people you're dealing with. So my question would be if, um, if my relative was to walk through the door and experience uh, some acceptance commitment training, um, what would that process look like? Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll speak as a researcher in Joanna. I don't know if you want to speak as a clinician or, or uh, I don't want to tell you how to answer. Obviously, you do your thing. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll quickly answer as a researcher. Uh, there's a very interesting theory about how anxiety disorders develop by David Barlow, who's a psychologist at Boston University. He may be retired at this point. He's been around for a while. And he talks about how there's three, vulnerab three vulnerabilities that kind of converge into um, you know, the creation of an anxiety disorder, basically. You have a generalized biological and psychological vulnerability that you know, we can just kind of thank our parents for those, unfortunately. You know, <laughs> if you have anxious parents, then chances are better than that, you're gonna also be an anxious person. Uh, so the biological is just like a, a high arousal tendency, basically. And the generalized psychological is kind of non-specific anxiety, not really like aimed in any specific direction yet. And those two in combination with a life event that is stressful kind of train someone to respond with an anxiety disorder response. And that's the third vulnerability, which is the specific psychological vulnerability. Um, usually that is in response to like a stressful performance for a musician with MPA or it, this applies across the board with people with anxiety disorders. So if you're someone with social anxiety, maybe you had like a, a upsetting performance where you're giving a public uh, presentation in class or something and you were you're fumbling through your notes or something like that. It doesn't take a lot really, you know, for someone to develop that disorder. Uh, but interestingly, it's maintained by rigid beliefs and avoidant behavior. So uh, take someone like Barbara Streisand, for example, I think her case is similar to your aunt's. She uh, had a performance meltdown as she coined it um, in front of Central Park, millions of people, perhaps, uh, maybe that's an exaggeration, maybe thousands of people, a huge audience. Yeah. Uh, she forgot the lyrics to one of her songs. And this is when she was like up and coming. This is back in like the mid sixties or so. And she swore off performing after that for like 30 or so years, just because of that one incident. And, and obviously I don't want to downplay it. I mean, it's, it was a very devastating experience for her to have that, you know, she kind of froze and didn't know what to do next. Um, but if you look at that from, from Barlow's perspective, you know, you clearly have, you know, these vulnerabilities kind of converging together to uh, lead to the creation of that disorder. And it's maintained by rigid beliefs and avoidant behavior. So she believed afterwards that there's something wrong with that happening again. I need, that's a threat. I have to avoid that experience from ever happening again. So I'm just gonna swear off public performances again. Uh, and I don't know what got her back in. I think she started using teleprompters actually that, that kind of bypassed that whole like problem for her entirely. So, uh, but that's still kind of a form of avoidance there. You know, you're not like throwing yourself back in for the potential of, you know, forgetting again and just kind of teaching yourself while forgetting that it's okay to forget. You just gotta like improvise and, and go with it. Um, so as a researcher, you have these vulnerabilities kind of converging for the creation of disorder. And from the ACT perspective, they're definitely maintained by uh, avoidant behavior and fusion with those kind of rigid beliefs that, you know, there's something wrong with having a performance meltdown like that. I need to avoid that, et cetera. Brilliant, thank you. Joanna, so, would you mind sharing from a, from a practitioner's point of view how, how you yes. would approach that issue? Right, so I think the one of the most interesting thing is that a lot of musicians believe that they cannot feel what they feel. So if I'm stressed, if I feel this tension in my muscles, in my body, 
it means that I'm a bad musician, that I cannot do this anymore, that I should give up and move to another field. So once I had this um, workshop for musicians, it was like three hours workshop. And after that time, I heard the feedback like, wow, now I realize that I'm not alone because a lot of people are experiencing the same emotions and it's okay to experience them. So this is something very, very deep in us that, you know, makes us believe that we cannot feel what, what we feel. So then there are all of these consequences that we think, okay, we don't have the right to be we're not accepting ourselves and then we go on this stage and there's like a blank mind and everything that we practice that we could do on our preparation classes it's gone (laughs) because we are focused on what if I make a mistake what will happen um, if I let my teacher down or everybody will be looking at me and I will be so embarrassed and it's terrible so it's something that is creating the circle and more I think I cannot feel it the more I feel it Mm -hmm. so it's never ending story so this is uh this sounds very very similar to uh a golf performance, particularly in in the smaller shots. Um, so I don't know if you know golf at all, but there's an aspect of golf that's called the short game. If you just miss the green and then you have to play onto the green, it's chipping and pitching. But these are very fine motor skills. They're not powerful movements. They're just uh, a lot of softness and feel is needed through the hands and the, the forearms. Um, and I've seen had so many people come to me time and time again. Uh, in golf, it's actually called the yips, where they've had this historical kind of, you know, devastating shot. Um, you know, they've really messed up when it's counted. And then this has just, you know, followed them like a, you know, like a nightmare. Yeah. Um, and I think the, 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 the mindfulness-based kind of act approach, as you said, opening people up to experience what they're feeling. Um, but what I'll do a lot with them is try and redirect their attention to the here and now of, okay, so what do I actually need to concentrate on here to, to be able to perform? Um, would that be a similar, as you're working through with the client, would that be a similar approach uh, with a musician? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I, I forget the researcher's first name, but it's Wolf. Uh, she talks about um, the importance of having an external focus of attention. Gabrielle, Gabrielle Wolf, yeah, exactly. Uh, and she partnered up with a um, musician slash researcher, Adina Mornell in Germany, and, and they applied this, this theory of kind of external versus internal attention to musicians. And they found that when musicians were focusing on the external effect of their performance, i.e. like kind of checking in with the audience and reading the audience to see how they're responding to what they're doing, rather than like being focused internally on like, you know, the sensations within the fingers, if they're pianists or, um, you know, similar kind of internal experiences, depending on the instrument. Uh, yeah, they, they definitely didn't score as highly on the adjudicated performance ratings. So uh, there's something to that. And, and you see that kind of across the board, you know, in other performance, you know, uh, Wolf talks about how you can acquire a new skill, you know, when you're more externally focused as opposed to internally. And, you know, this idea of putting on a better performance, I think that applies too. So it, it's absolutely essential to have like attention retraining be part of, uh, be part of the act work here. So that could be done through mindfulness. It can be done, you know, through a number of different ways. You know, sometimes even just playing an instrument is like a attention retraining exercise because it's always, you know, happening in the moment. It's always ongoing. So you can like build psychological flexibility into your own like music practice like that. So would uh, musicians then walk through a, an exposure, a progressive exposure exercise? Yes, uh, at, at least we think so. And, and what I mean by that is typically speaking, um, the, the best well-known way to uh, extinguish a fear is to do exposure therapy. That's at least if you ask any clinical psychologist who treats anxiety, uh, we were led to believe that that's the case at least. Um, but interestingly, um, in the new re- research I've been doing, 
I've been training music teachers to do act coaching with their students directly rather than kind of outsourcing this work to someone like myself. And obviously they're not trained psychotherapists, so they don't do exposure therapy. They don't do any kind of therapy. Um, and we just recently finished up work and it was published uh, this, this past year. I trained a singing teacher in the UK to do act coaching and she replicated the results that I got when I did therapy with vocal students, with her own vocal student, nearly identically. Uh, it was such a remarkably similar outcome and she didn't do any exposure therapy work with the student. That was the funny part. She just taught the student, you know, mindfulness, acceptance, diffusion, kind of all the left half. She dove a little bit into the right half with values and committed action, but it was pr primarily more left half work and same questionnaire, same trend in the questionnaire data, same results. So I found that to be interesting and perhaps exposure therapy isn't, you know, as necessary as, as a lot of psychologists think it is. But then again, this is an I, I can, oh. hard to generalize with an N of one, right? Sorry. <laughs> Uh, I could also add that there are new methods that develop um, that help to develop this uh, exposure therapy things like um, virtual reality. So we can actually put the glasses, virtual reality glasses on, and then you see the whole audience and then you can kind of treat your anxiety to, to imagine you're on this stage and do all of those things. That's the wow. one thing. Another thing that I observed myself um, and actually it's happening in Royal College of Music, they have a special room where they perform in front of the video of judges that are sitting and kind of assessing them. And there are three forms um, of this video. So once they're happy, once they're un unhappy, and once they're like neutral. So they prepare the performer to, to, to be able to deal with all the possible reactions. So it's kind of similar to, to exposure therapy and it's more like practical thing to use for musicians. So you mentioned the, uh, the word diffusion. So for, for those who would be watching the podcast and not be familiar with that uh, expression, would you mind just taking me through that, David? Sure, sure. Uh, I'm a visual person. I use my hands when I talk, so I use a visual metaphor. And I've actually seen Steve Hayes do a similar one in his TED Talk uh, when talking about fusion versus diffusion. Uh, if you can imagine that you can see into my mind right now and you see a bunch of thoughts popping in and out as uh, reflected by my hands here, when you're fused with a thought, it occurs right here in your mind's eye. It's just like so front and center. You don't recognize it as a thought you perceive it as real and you just kind of automatically blindly react to it as if it's real. But when you're defused and there's certainly techniques to kind of take a thought from right here in your mind to right about here, where it's not the case you're trying to push it into the back of the mind, you're just kind of noticing it more, more easily. You can perceive it for what it is. Um, and therefore, you know, that gives you like that second to kind of pause and question yourself, what do I want to do with this thought right here? Whereas, you know, when you're fused, you don't have that ability to kind of like think through your response. You just, ah, you just react to your thought there. So diffusion means that ability to kind of like notice thinking rather than blindly react to thinking. And there's literally hundreds of ways to diffuse. So we can get into that. There's some fun ones for musicians too, like singing your thoughts out loud. Or I had one musician I worked with, I'll quickly say, um, she had a lot of um, hyperactivity, uh, ADHD, as well as anxiety. So her mind was very busy. She was a brilliant person. And we came up with a fun diffusion exercise to create a song uh, called her brain song in which she, she turned specific thoughts into riffs that she would therefore play on her instrument. And, you know, like, uh, you know, anxious thoughts had one riff, sad thoughts had another. And the idea was in time, this is a pretty elaborate diffusion technique. When you're experiencing those thoughts in real time, you, she trained herself to play specific things in response on her viola. She's a violist. So, uh, when you can do something like that and just stay present with the thinking rather than like blindly react to it, then you're diffusing. That was a, so a really um, experiential exercise includes, so she would actually, whatever thoughts were showing up, she would then play it. Yep. Wow. Yeah, they, they were translated into specific, like very simple riffs, like an anxiety riff is just like fast and intense. A yeah. sad riff is just kind of slow and somber and, and doesn't really do much. And um, it was up to her. I, I, as a creative person myself, I kind of uh, get excited when, you know, the potential of creating techniques, uh, uh, you know, comes up in the session. So I, I left it up to her to kind of fill in the blanks, but that was the general template for the technique for her. So really the, the idea behind diffusion is to 
say when performers are having thoughts show up, which, you know, we've all had, um, you know, what if I mess this up? You know, this is the kind of the crucial shot or this is the kind of one of the, you know, crucial moments of the performance. Mm-hmm. And, you know, don't get this wrong. Don't mess it up. So what you're saying is a uh, kind of diffusion training over time can give you that ability to, to just to, to have that thought show up, but have it with a little bit of space, a little bit of distance from you. So what you're saying is, what I'm hearing is there's more ability to put your attention back into what you're trying to do. Um, And certainly my experience from um, uh, when I used to perform at a a good level, which is a a few years and a few hundred gray hairs ago, was um, the psychology training I'd had at the time was very much about, well, kind of take those take those issues and those thoughts that you've got with performance and and um, try and dispute them, try and challenge them and, and actually question, remind yourself of, you know, your training and convince yourself that you are going to hit a good shot. And, you know, over time, mentally, that was pretty exhausting to have to constantly remind myself that you know, I can do it. And then my the other half of me was saying, well, no, you can't. Yep. And then I was saying, yes, I can. It's kind of back and forth. So the, the mindfulness-based methods for me was a real kind of liberating experience in terms of um, dropping the rope as as Stephen Hayes, the kind of forefather act would would describe. Um, So have you, did you have any um, performance anxiety or have you had musicians come to you that have had different or tried different approaches before using act? Me, yes, absolutely. And CBT, you know, undoubtedly is like the predominant one uh, prior to act. And, you know, just like in kind of PST, you know, they're taught to dispute their thinking and replace, you know, distorted with more rational thoughts and whatnot. And um, I, I want to I, I bring up a research study that was done pretty recently, actually, in which ACT was compared to CBT uh, as a public speaking anxiety treatment. And as part of the uh, research, they actually hooked participants up to what's called an Efner's machine, a functional near infrared uh, spectroscopic. It's like a portable MRI machine. So uh, while these participants are going through the training and then at the very end, they're speaking in front of a a group and they're being rated on their ability to speak, they're also being monitored to see um, the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex in particular was being monitored. And a very interesting trend emerged. The ACT group was using that part of the brain less in giving these speeches and the CBT group was using that part of the brain more. And that part of the brain is actually implicated in like uh, inner monologue, basically, and your ability to switch from task to task. So as you can probably put two and two together here, the CBT group was essentially like taxing their working memory. They're, they're mm-hmm. disputing thoughts while giving a speech, you know, which made them guess, uh, it, it earned them less good ratings, basically, on their ability to, to speak. Whereas the ACT group was just more present in their ability because, you know, they're diffusing. They're not like kind of taking these thoughts, these are the good ones and these are bad ones, get rid of these over here. They're just simply being present in the task and diffusing uh, kind of in real time. So it's a pretty remarkable finding and it's actually been replicated too. So there is something very taxing about having to dispute thoughts over and over again while performing. Yeah, that, that's, uh, yeah that's incredible. I mean, that, that really um, backs up, I, I suppose, what I felt intuitively with, the, with my experience, but a much more mindfulness-based approach where um, I've, I've, I've just been exhausted, frankly, after... <laughs> After ends, you know, even though sometimes I've done pretty well and had some success with the with the old way, but yeah, over time it really ground me down and um, maybe felt like um, if I was in a tug of war with a, my own mind, then over time mm-hmm. the my mind was getting stronger and stronger, and I was having to pull harder and harder. Yep. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's astonishing the amount of um, golfers that will come to me and be very much you know they'll they'll say things like uh you know if if i could just be if i could just think about hitting it positively or if i could just think about performing well um you know if i could just relax before i played this show then i'll be then i'll be okay then i'll be cured of 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 the issues um has has that very much been your experience within uh, performance anxiety with the music as well having this uh, as I think you said earlier about having these rules that you're, you're holding on too tightly yep you're going to exaggerate the problem 
excuse me. Mm. Joanna, you want to answer? I'm, I'm having a hard time talking. Yeah, right <laughs> what is very interesting <clears throat> about ACT, I can say, is that you don't really have to filter <clears throat> all of your thoughts, whether they are true or they are false. Mm -hmm. You rather let them be and choose which one you like to use for your own purposes to pursue your values. So once I was thinking, um, what kind of metaphor I, I could give to musicians to let them understand it better? Because it all sounds like, you know, psychological, scientific, blah, blah, blah. But what does it mean like for them? So there is such a thing as the, the, the swing rhythm. So in music, it means that instead of um, normal like eight notes or normal eight crochet, you have something else, like the rhythm is kind of differing from the, the usual one. And then there is a question, like wh which kind of rhythm you pick for your music because you're the composer. So it doesn't mean that the swing rhythm is bad or rhythm which is not swing is kind of like less interesting or something, but what is useful for you? So th this is one thing, which thoughts or, you know, attitudes are useful and you want to use them. But there is another thing that is very amazing in ACT, which is focusing on values. So I can say from my own perspective that I had a very, very big breakthrough during my uh, recital diploma in music school. Of course, it's a very stressing event because you're being recorded, your whole family goes there. It's like your last performance, everybody's watching you and you're gonna show off what you learned for like four years of your education. And while singing the last song, I answered one question, okay? I'm not gonna be on the stage probably, you know, in a, future so this is my last chance to enjoy this <coughs> moment and just to have fun with this music and I thought of all the reasons why I started to sing why is it important why do I enjoy why do I want to put all of this effort to doing this and then instead of focusing on oh my gosh I'm gonna make a mistake you're focusing on something which is positive, which is energizing. And then your whole anxiety doesn't matter because you're actually doing something that is, you know, making you feel that your life makes sense. It's something very, very deep. <laughs> so the so the values piece uh, within within act, you're saying that that's, uh, that's an integral part of increasing the willingness to um, have the things, the experiences that come along with putting yourself in those situations. Yes, because then we can answer the question, what is the purpose? Because, okay, we can use CBT methods. We can, you know, kind of try to reinforce us, reinforce our behavior. And then there is a question, why? Mm -hmm. Why should we do this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the values piece really incentivizes clients to to, to do the willingness to do the acceptance piece of act there. You know, hence acceptance and commitment there. If you can stay committed to your values, then, you know, the distress is still there. You know, you can't get rid of it, unfortunately, but it, it kind of is framed differently. It, it makes more sense to you why you're feeling that way, or it's less bothersome why you're feeling that way to you, so. Yeah, so before there's, there's, there's something that's, um, that's attracted them to, uh, you know, whatever they're playing, whether it would be athletics, golf, speaking in front of people or music. And are you, are you saying about getting people in, back in touch with their values and, and what was important about that initially? And once they kind of reconnect with that, then <coughs> the, willingness to, the willingness to step back into mm -hmm. those environments has increased. Would that line with the research, David? Uh, yes, excuse me, I don't know why I'm having a hard time talking right now. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Yes, uh, in fact, I talk about this in, in my forthcoming book, uh, Act for Musicians, which uh, God willing, as soon as I finish writing, will we'll be published next year. Um, I have a chapter on performance enhancement. Um, and from an act perspective, there appear to be three ways that uh, you can enhance performance. 
And it really just depends on which half of the Hexaflex processes you are using. If you just go all left half and do mindfulness acceptance diffusion, there's actually more studies showing that that actually enhances your performance. Um, but it doesn't really, uh, it doesn't really uh, call you to like add anything new, basically. You're just simply like being more present and that becomes more noticeable to the audience. You know, uh, you can tell when a musician is present, you can tell when a, uh, someone is being present, basically. Um, the right half only, there's been a handful, not as many, but then there's a, a few studies just showing that, you know, training in values, training in committed action, and to a lesser extent, training in selfless context actually does lead to enhanced performance. Uh, there's a study in which that was used with academic students in undergraduate school, and, and they actually had better test scores after receiving six sessions of just right half stuff only. Um, the work I do involves the combination of left and right. And I, I don't want to say that the combination works better than either of those two previous methods, but I'd like to think it does, though, because, you know, you're both cultivating the ability to be present through mindfulness, acceptance, diffusion, uh, and also adding in things that are of value to you, um, which becomes engaging for the audience. You know, they, they pick up on when someone's expressive because they value being expressive. Or they, they pick up on when someone's living their values in the actual performance itself. Um, and to give you an example, uh, I'm sure you've seen Caitlin Ohashi. She's the UCLA gymnast uh, who gave the perfect 10 out of 10 gymnastics performance last yes. year in 2019. Everyone's seen it. It's got like you know, millions of YouTube views and whatnot. If you haven't seen it, Joanna, definitely check it out. She, oh. she was a, amazing, is an amazing gymnast who just put on a flawless routine and got a perfect 10. She's one of very few people to recently get a perfect 10 on her performance. And she's clearly present uh, because, you know, she's like intentional about what she's doing. She's not like uh, purposeless with her behavior. It's this very like grounded, very intentional movement. Um, so you could, you know, kind of check that off the list there. She appears to be present. Uh, but she's also adding in just like fun little like Michael Jackson style kicks, you know, here and there and just like doing like kind of pivots, uh, you know, with her hip and just like fun movements that are very expressive, basically. And you can tell when someone's engaging in values like that, because if you check with the audience, uh, at least the audience was many of her, her teammates. Uh, I don't know if the camera really pans back to see the full audience, but her teammates, at least, they mimic her behavior. They kind of mimic her head movements and her, her upper body movements. So that's, I think, in my opinion, evidence that, you know, she's engaged so much with her valued actions that others around her are engaging with her. So it becomes like this contagious kind of engagement with performance there. So um, I think that's a, an argument that being both present and living your values and your performances, you know, it's probably the better approach than either or. But that's just my opinion, though. <laughs> I would say it's kind of, um, <clears throat> sorry. Go on, Joanna. It's consistent mm -hmm. with this uh, flow idea that mm -hmm. during performances we can experience this flow which allows us to be both happy, uh, living our life with, with the purpose that we want to have and just be here and now because when I'm on a stage only this moment is important. It doesn't matter what will do, you know, what will happen and if you are, you know, here looking at all of those people, but maybe there's no one, maybe there's only one person, but it doesn't matter because you're actually living your values. You are mm -hmm. st standing on this stage and doing the most amazing thing that can happen. You're actually performing, which is your dream, which is something very amazing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um... I've certainly had a, a sense of uh, appreciating, you know, the, the few kind of performances and competitions I now uh, play in. Um, I, can, I can definitely get a sense of appreciating those moments more. But what might be for, for someone who's, uh, for a performer who's never been, uh, had a values conversation before, how might you introduce them to it? And how might you um, help them to, to discover what it is that, that, that's important to them about performing. I don't know what you do, Joanna. Um, there's certainly like a lot of question and answer uh, sessions that you know you can engage with the client. Uh, that can sometimes take like two or three sessions. Uh, when I have that conversation, I ask questions like, when you're feeling most alive or excited or engaged with your performance, what are you doing? Or similarly, you know, like kind of watching other performers who make you feel alive and engaged, you know, what, what are they doing? Uh, you can kind of link it to states of motivation or states of engagement like that. 
You can also link it to the presence of positive affect, you know, because when you're feeling alive, you know, you feel good, right? So there's some kind of intrinsic reward in, in doing X activity, whatever X activity is that makes you feel good like that. Or questions like, you know, if you couldn't do X activity, for example, let's say you really love to express yourself. If you woke up tomorrow as a performer and you were, you know, the, the ability to express was deleted from your behavior or repertoire, then what would that make you feel like? How would you feel? And if they feel sad, if they are kind of grieving the loss of that, then that's another link to your values there. If you are sad in its absence rather than happy in its presence, then, you know, whatever you're talking about, there is clearly a value too. So questions yeah. like that can tap into. So, so what, what kind of uh, what kind of values might crop up? How, how would they? Uh, what are, What are the common ones for performance? Johnny, you I can guess, probably answer that one. Yeah. Best. <laughs> um, they can, you know, be a lot of different values for different people. So there is not such a thing as common values because each person have their own values. So. Once I asked um, like 15 people group, why did you start it to be a musician? Why did you start it to, why did you start to perform? And they all gave different answers, but you know, it's like, what made you to be there in this moment? So they go back all of this, you know, no, because of my teacher told me so. No, because of oh. I want to have nice grade. No, because, you know, I just have to do that. They just go back to this, like, internal motivation. And then they're like, well, but I forgot about this. I, you know, I, I was just thinking, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh, audition is coming. But why? <laughs> okay. So there can be, for example, just the pleasure of music or you know, feeling that, that you're giving, developing yourself, giving your, your skills for the society to, to let them perform. It can be love, spreading love through the people. It can be a lot of different things. Uh, it depends on a person, seriously. <laughs> There's a list of values. <laughs> like there are how many of them? Like 30 values or something. And uh, it's, available on ACBS website. So sometimes I give this whole list of values and ask, which do you choose? Like, think about them. <laughs> I've come up with a similar list of my own uh, in, in, in my upcoming book, uh, specific to musicians' values. And uh, these are just ones that I've observed in the student and professionals I've worked with. And they've kind of indirectly talked about a few, expressing oneself emotionally. That's a big one for musicians. Uh, like staying true to technique and really like focusing on technique is, a, is absolutely a big one, especially with classical musicians. And uh, there's maybe 10 or 15 other ones that I've found, uh, but they're kind of similar to what Joanna is talking about here, you know, like participating in the beauty of music and sharing that. That's, that's a big one for a lot of musicians too. Fantastic. So just to summarize, if, if someone's listening, who's, um, you know, struggling with performance anxiety right now, um, if you could just summarize in a couple of sentences what the what the future might hold for them, if they look into this a little bit more, in a couple of sentences, could you summarize uh, how ACT might help them get back to performing well, what that process might look like? We were joking that it's not only about preparation, right? <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Uh Yes, of course. Uh, perhaps I missed that part of the conversation. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's like, but I think I know um, what you're talking about, though. Yeah. So that, it was like, it's, it's not only about preparation, because a lot of people really think that, oh, I should be prepared. I should be prepared. And they're exercising. Sometimes they're over prepared. So especially for singers, if they sing too much, it's even worse for, for their voice. Um, it's not beneficial. Um, instead of over preparing yourself and thinking that you're not prepared enough, just ask yourself a question. Why are you doing this? What was the reason that you started all of this process? First thing. And the second thing is all of this mindfulness. So just stay at the stage. Look everywhere around you. What colors do you see? Can you name them? 
something very, very easy. Yeah, uh, I guess the elevator pitch in two sentences or less is use left half hexaflex skills. And what I mean by that are mindfulness, acceptance and diffusion. Use them to help you lower your struggle with MPA. So that way you're no longer struggling with it. You're just simply kind of being with thoughts, being with distress while simultaneously uh, identifying things that you value and figuring out concrete ways to actually insert that into your performances or into your practice or into other domains of, of your musical you know, life that are important uh, and, and have them be observable to others. You know, when you engage in valued actions, you're essentially taking on new behavior, acquiring new behaviors here. So have them be uh, observable to others and you know you're doing that correctly when you feel engaged and excited more with what, what's happening in the moment. So if you can do both of those simultaneously, you're a psychologically flexible performer there. Fantastic. Yeah, what a wonderful conversation it's been and I should have learned so much as well. Um, really interesting to compare kind of more of the, the, the sports world to, to the world of music and uh, seeing the overlaps and the, and the slight differences. So that's been really revealing. So um, David and Joanna, thank you so much for your time. I'll, um, are there any ways that people can get in touch with you and or uh, websites they can visit? Yes, there is a website, Act With Music. Also on Facebook and Instagram. <laughs> and David? Um, I'm actually on faculty at a school in the UK uh, that's up and coming. It's called The Voice Workshop. So you can reach me through the voice workshop dot, uh, how are they in the UK, dot UK, dot CO or dot CO, dot UK, uh, I forget. Yeah, dot co, dot UK, yeah. Dot co, dot UK, the voice workshop, dot co, dot UK. Um, in fact, we're actually developing a new master's program unveiling next, uh, next spring, 2021, where we're gonna be teaching a lot of ACT coaching skills to music teachers who wanna do this work with their students, to others, other professionals, psychologists, therapists who wanna do this work with their students, so. Uh, stay tuned for more information on that webpage, and you can certainly contact me with questions about the school or questions about myself uh, on that webpage. And read the book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the book is the is book coming book. coming around the same time, May or June of next year too. So, Brilliant. Uh, stay tuned for that. I'll make sure I include these bits in the show notes. So, thank you for a great episode, and um, all the best with your future, all the best with your future research, and Joanna, all the best with your. Um, your musical uh, endeavors. Thank you. Cheers. Nice to meet you, Trevor. And yeah, do stay in touch if you have more questions. Love to have dialogue.